coming up in the CNBC debate, Investing in India, with your host, Martin Soon. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you on behalf of the World Economic Forum and also CNBC. Thank you for joining us. We've got about 60 minutes to spend uh, with you here in this room. So let's get right to it and inter introduce our panel in no particular order. Uh, to my right, we've got Ramesh Abhishek from uh, the government, uh, Secretary of Industrial Policy and Promotion of India. Uh, next to him, we have Yusuf Ali, Chairman and Managing Director, the Lulu Group International, based in the UAE, United Arab Emirates, and I understand very heavily invested in India with even more, ag more aggressive plans. Uh, in consumer-related hypermarts, in malls, in, in hotels uh, as well. Uh, for the private sector or uh, management consultant perspective, Sri uh, Rajan, who's the chairman of Bain and Company uh, India, and last but not least, uh, uh, the rose among four thorns here, uh, Rachel Whetstone, <laughs> Senior Vice President, Policy and Communications, Uber Technologies, out of, of course, uh, the United States. And she would be not just a foreign investor, but also, I guess, the tech disruptor. Uh, uh, perspective for this uh, for this panel of ours. So, as you can see, a very I think perfectly pitched uh, panel to talk about um, this issue of investing in India, which is very broad. We could go many different ways. We could talk about uh, the impending GST. We could talk uh, about uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, Make in India uh, policy or campaign, and we probably will do all of that. But what I'd like to do is to simplify it because I'm uh, not a very smart guy, I'm not very complicated. So let's look at this in a linear fashion and talk about investing in India uh, over a timeline of three very simple points. Getting in, while you're in doing business, and also getting out. And Ramesh, if I could call on you first to talk us through this first point, getting in, the, the entry or, or entrance for any foreign investor uh, wanting to do business in India. Obviously, the Modi government has made uh, significant changes to make things much easier, faster, more efficient, uh, more pleasant, maybe, to do business in India. Help us to recap the major changes in your mind. Give us a, an update, the status or the state of play where we are today, and also talk about impending or upcoming changes that we can all look forward to. You know, India always uh had the, as someone has said, largest unfulfilled potential. But somehow uh, we needed to have a set of policies that were required to fulfill that potential. You know, young population and large middle class. And, you know, uh, uh, so all that uh, we need, uh, this government is trying now to implement a series of transformative actions and policies which are required to realize this potential. So for example, uh, our FDI policies, you know, but they were very restrictive. Now we have made it, uh, made India one of the most open economies. Even in very sensitive sectors, we have allowed 100% FDI and the automatic route in most cases. 92% of FDI comes under automatic route now, and we are further relaxing the FDI regime. Similarly, it came to uh, different tax policies. Now GST is going to provide finally an union uh, in, within India where doing business will be so much easier. The cascading effect of taxes will go away, the high transaction costs, you know, movement across uh, borders of states. So all this is going to really help. Mm -hmm. So uh, apart from providing this infrastructure, another big bottleneck in our manufacturing and our doing business. So now we have very ambitious plans in highways, railways, ports, inland waterways. Mm -hmm. So all these are being done now. Mm -hmm. And another big area, of course, has been ease of doing business. We doing business in India has never been easy. Over decades, we have made our processes, procedures extremely complicated for no particular reason, because now the government is fully focused on making things simpler. If you just think about starting a company, uh, it used to take many, many days. Now, with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs bringing out a lot of reforms, it takes only one plus working day. It's, as a matter of fact, this is being further simplified now. Ramesh, let me quickly jump in. Uh, you know, both the IMF as well as the World Bank uh, think that India's economy is going to grow at about 7.5% this year. That would still be the fastest growing big economy, major economy in the world. So you've made all these changes. At 7.5%, why do you need more? As a matter of fact, I think we need to grow at at least double digit for at least two decades. 
with a per capita income of about fifteen hundred dollars, I don't think the seven and a half percent is good enough. Ah. And we can do so far give better. Me a number. Double digits, low, mid, high? Oh, and we will definitely aim for the highest. But let's see. <laughs> all right. We need to do all the things that are needed to be done. You know, we need to improve our business climate, infrastructure, tax environment. All these things are done. There's a huge potential. Okay, I have to ask you, uh, the final numbers for uh, the impending GST are not out yet. I think a lot of people are waiting for them still. Uh, but your economic modeling, and I'm sure you've, you've done a lot of that, uh, if you're at 7.5% per, uh, now, based on the final numbers of the GST, it would bump up growth in India by roughly how much? Give me a range. Uh, see, One percentage point, uh, two? No, I, well, I know I will not be able to give a specific number, but you see the lot of transactions which are not taking in the formal sector now will actually come in the formal sector. So it's part of the economy, but it's not recorded. So those will also come into this. And okay. so, so, so this so is fascinating. <laughs> what you're talking about is the black gray informal economy at this juncture right now today. That is how much of the official economy, do you think? I don't think there are very accurate estimates. Yeah. But this GST itself is a game changer for Make in India and manufacturing. Because, you know, the cascading effect of taxes is gone. And actually, for makers here, they get much better refund on inputs. Mm. And they get a much better level playing field against imports. So, and uh, of course, not to uh, speak of the easy compliance that mm. will going to come in. Okay. So this Make in India uh, program is going to get a big boost with GST. Okay. So I think growth rates is definitely going to go up. I think exactly how it pans out, there may be some pain in the first uh, initial year or so, yeah. but ultimately it's going to be extremely helpful. Okay, I have to ask you a blunt question. Uh, you know, several people I've talked to say that whether it is uh, the impending GSC, whether it's April of next year or more likely than not a little bit later, uh, the ensuing months, the first several months, there is going to be chaos. Are you anticipating this? No, I will not say there is going to be chaos. But you see the initial, uh, there are a lot of processes and procedures that need to be in place. Yeah. The corporates, the business, they also need to get adjusted to this. Mm -hmm. So those initial months could be, you know, there will they'll be adjustment month or transition period. Mm -hmm. But it's not, they're not going to be a chaos. Mm -hmm. See, the country has been preparing for this for quite some time. Mm -hmm. The technological framework is in place. Okay. So I think uh, all that is going to work out quite well. So here's maybe a silly question. At first, I was going to ask you whether the, you think the private sector uh, is ready, you know, whether it's uh, what we know or the black gray informal sector, which is going to be uh, co-opted into this whole uh, new tax structure. But rather, I'd, I'd be more interested to know, bluntly, is the government ready? I think government has a, made a plan and schedule yeah. for implementing GST. And so far, uh, they are only ahead of the time. You know, the, all the, uh, this bill was passed by majority of the assemblies. It got the approval of the president. So it has constitutional amendment bill has become a law now. Mm. And GST council has been formed. They have met a number of times. And a number of very important decisions have been taken by them. So it's all going according to the schedule of 1st April 2017. Okay, but you have many states which are still not happy. See, uh, there's a consensus that this has to be done. And uh, I think this is the broadest possible political consensus that uh, we have received in support of GST. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, this is going to roll out as planned. Okay, all right. Rachel, uh, for Uber, you've been, you guys have been in the country for, in India for, what, about three years three or years, so, yeah. right? Just recap for us. Well, I mean, what's your experience uh, been? How, how daunting or how surprisingly smooth has it been for, for you? Um, I think that we've um, just been... Um, incredibly grateful for a lot of the support that we've had. Obviously when you're going into cities, uh, you're bringing a new way of getting around the city. Um, people have questions about that. Uh, you're both trying to get riders to join the platform. You're also trying to get drivers on board. So you're trying to create a, a, a two-sided market in a, in a new area. Um, and in India, we have seen very supportive um, uh, uh, governments. Um, you also see different flavors of what different governments want to achieve for their cities. Mm -hmm. But generally, um, you know, we're now in 20 plus cities. We're going to be in another four by the end of the year. Um, we have over 200,000 drivers who use the um, app uh, every month. Um, and so it's, it's, been a, it's been a great place for us to be. Um, and we found that, um, you know, it's, it's been very successful. You've got, you've got Ramesh right here, just yeah. feet away from you. Yeah. 
What more would you like to see the Indian government do to make it easier or better for Uber to do business? Um, I think that there are ways that you can simplify, simplify the permit process for drivers, um, which is not necessarily so much a, a central government thing, it's a, 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 state level, uh, a state level thing and city level thing. Um, the reality is that the more um, barriers that you have that a driver has to get through to get onto the platform, uh, the less flexibility they have. So it's it's interesting in, in countries where you have uh, um, more um, permits and rules and regulations, the drivers tend to look more full-time. So they'll drive mm, sort of 20, 25 hours plus a week. And in cities where you maybe have a single licensing regime where the license is held by the operator and the operator is responsible for the consumer protection, safety and um, competition, you'll see a lot of drivers who drive for less than 10 hours a week. So if as a city you want to use it as a flexible earning opportunity, um, then you need to think about how many barriers you're putting in. The barriers also have an effect, um, which we don't, don't see in India, but we see in other countries where you, you put a lot of barriers in the way, then you don't have as many riders and drivers on the system. You don't have as many identical trips, i.e. people going from point A to point B at exactly the same time. Um, and it's by those identical trips that you can introduce Uber pool and carpooling, mm -hmm. and then you can get more people into fewer cars, which has obvious benefits for the city. But we have um, found, uh, you know, in Delhi and other places, the government has been very receptive to Uber pool because they understand that there are ways that you can use smartphones plus the existing infrastructure to get more people into fewer cars mm -hmm. and to ex extend the public transit networks at no cost to the taxpayer. Mm. Uh, I know that Uber has a program. Uh, I guess it's kind of a, a fleet. Uh, program which involves uh, right now a few government uh, offices or, or departments. Does that include yours? Uh, no, not really, but uh, if I may just add. Please. See, all these technological innovations that are coming in, yeah. which are very in disruptive in nature, uh, they are creating huge amount of jobs in our country. They are also providing the much needed services to uh, consumers. So we are all for it. As a matter of fact, government has uh, set up a committee on how we can promote e-commerce in the country and we have had presentations from a number of companies like Uber, and we are trying to see where the bottlenecks are in all these areas of e-commerce, and we want to fix those problems. Mm. Though I must say, Rachel, that uh, getting a driving license in India, one thought was a bit too easy. It should be made a little more rigorous, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it wasn't the, 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 there's the associated bits yeah, that okay. sometimes... No, no, I get your part. Yeah. Um, yes, I think we all want drivers to have driving licenses and to be good drivers. Okay, for the record, Ramesh, I have to ask you, right? You've got Uber in three years ago. Okay, you have uh, the dominant uh, player in the industry happens to be uh, an Indian company, uh, Ola. Can you give... Rachel, a reassurance that there is no even unintentional preference towards a local player. See, uh, I think it's the job of the government and the regulators to promote competition, okay. which actually uh, protects and benefits the consumers. So we are here to make sure that we have an environment which is not anti-competitive mm -hmm. and where there is maximum competition. So that is the policy of the government and that is what the government should be doing. And, and we, from our perspective, we believe that we are operating in a very competitive um, uh, place where the best product will win. And we believe that the government is entirely even-handed in the way it thinks about those things and very pro-competition. So uh, from our perspective, we have absolute confidence that that's how things are working. Okay, I may be stirring up a horn's nest, but we are all professionals and we are all adults here. Uh, the legacy, reputational uh, legacy and damage from that very unfortunate and tragic incident mm -hmm. where an Uber driver uh, carried a passenger, a woman who allegedly uh, was raped. Obviously the government is aware of this, obviously the public is very much uh, aware of this. Does this at all play into government thinking when you look at foreign entrants like Uber. Uh, I think this incident, I don't know if it has anything to do with the ownership pattern of the company. Uh, I think it's more important... It's how they do things. Uh, I think uh, it's more important that uh, we have uh, safety checks in place. Mm -hmm. You know, the background check on drivers, whether employed by a foreign company or Indian company. Mm -hmm. I think those kind of precautions are very important. Okay, now are you satisfied yeah. they are doing all those now? I'm sorry? Are you satisfied that they are doing what they need to do? Uh, well, I haven't really gone into what they have done, but I mean, there has not been, there has not been many incidents after that, so, yeah. Thankfully, yes. Yeah. Uh, Indeed. Shri, if I can uh, come to you uh, and uh, talk us through a bit more about this entry uh, part of the equation along this timeline, three points. How would you assess how the Modi government has done halfway through its term now? So I must say that actually they've done a pretty good job. 
uh, you know, if you look back over the course of the last couple of years, they've improved the entry of companies into the sector. It doesn't have to do with foreign investment, but even Indian companies as an example. And one of the things that uh, Mr. Abhishek talked about was reducing the amount of time it takes to register a company. That's come down very significantly. I do want to make a couple of points, which is that while the entry part of it has eased up, and I can say this on behalf of many of my clients who are looking to invest in India. Mm. I do want to, you didn't ask this question, but I do want to touch upon it, which is the difficulty of doing business in India is still very significant, and we shouldn't shy away from that. And part of the reason is that it doesn't just have to do with the central government, and the central government has done a lot of good work in terms of making it easy to come into the country if you're a foreign investor, and to also do business in India in terms of approvals. What I was mentioning actually to Mr. Abhishek right before this conversation, that there is still a significant set of challenges that companies face mm -hmm. when they set up operations in India, especially so in the manufacturing sector. And I, I think the reason why there's been such a significant growth in the services sector over the course of the last 25 years is that the truth is that it takes much less to set up and run a services company in India than it does to operate a manufacturing plant. Lower barriers to entry is what you're Lower saying. Lower barriers to entry, and the problem is that, and I say this again on behalf probably of many people in this room, which is that when you actually set up a plant in India, you are stuck. And you therefore are subject to all the vagaries of the local governments, whether it's the state government or the local governments. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of work that still remains to be done to improve the ease of doing business once you actually set up operations. And the final point around the exit, I think you know the bankruptcy, the insolvency code that's come into place. We have to see the fine print, the detail of the implementation and how it's going to be done. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a great step in the right direction. But this middle part, that's the part that still needs a lot of attention in my mind. Okay. Once you're in and you are, are doing business right. is where uh, the attention needs right. to and be. Yeah. So, so, okay, pick three things. In that middle part, what needs to change? What needs to get better? What does the government need to do better? So I would say that uh, the, f the first part is really around what GST will solve. So the whole set of transit taxes and, and, and hopefully the implementation will happen in a way that it doesn't complicate matters even further. I don't think it will. But the best outcome would be to actually remove all the barriers in terms of uh, transport of goods uh, and services as well. We haven't talked about services, but transports of goods and services across the country. That's number one. Number two is that there are a lot of regulations still at the local level, and there is no consistency. We're not expecting, I don't think any of my clients are expecting that the same regulation has to happen you know, in one state versus another but some level of consistency, both in terms of what the intent of the regulation is, mm. as well as actually the enforcement of the regulation. I think there's still a lot of discretionary power still at the local level, and it's very difficult to figure out how to navigate that. Okay, but you'd have to agree that, you know, harmonization of the tax code, at least at a federal level, I is agree. a pretty good start. I completely agree. Yes. I completely agree with that. Okay. So number two would be to just, you know, pay a little more attention to really what's happening at the local level. And then number three would be really, you know, um, this is something that we've talked about in the past over the last year and a half or so, which is standards bodies. You know, the role that they play in different industries and making sure that again, there is consistency and transparency in which they operate and making sure that, you know, people understand the, the regulatory environment mm -hmm. in which an industry is expected to operate. I would say those are three things that the government should think about. And is the government addressing these? As a matter of fact, uh, that gives me an opportunity to Perfect. share with all of you what we are doing on ease of doing business with states. Okay. You know, uh, as a matter of fact, perhaps uh, the first uh, experiment of its kind anywhere, uh, uh, we are ranking states in ease of doing business. Mm -hmm. This started last year on a 98-point action plan, states were ranked. <coughs> and after that, we find a huge amount of competition among states to actually improve the business climate. Mm -hmm. Now there are 340 points of starting from if you want to start a business, what is the kind of information that is required? Is it there in one place? And when you start a business, what are the clearances and how much time it takes? And when you are doing a business, compliances, inspections and all that, and exit and enforcement of contracts. So there are 340 points. If you see the website that we have on ease of doing business or DIPP website, 
this evaluation is being done by the World Bank team, which is working with us. Mm. So in a federal country, that's uh, it's the basically not the central government that is doing the evaluation, it's the World Bank team. Okay. But they work with us. And uh, 12 states have got more than 75% score this year. And uh, 11 states have got more than 83% score. And in that website, you can see uh, what reforms they have done. The laws, the circulars, the guidelines that have been made mm -hmm. are all on that website. Mm -hmm. But I completely agree with Sri. All this must be reflected on the ground. And since these reforms have been done, laws have been made, things have been changed, because the states are realizing that unless they do this, their investors are not going to come. Mm. And as a matter of fact, you have to also keep the existing investors there. Mm. So there is a big uh, re realization now mm. that they have to improve their business climate, they have to improve these ground level problems which are very much there, mm -hmm. which have been there, which are improving, mm -hmm. but we need to do much more. Okay, Yusuf Ali and the Lulu Group, obviously you have come, or your investments have come into India and you have very aggressive and ambitious plans for further investments. Yes. I know despite all these issues and problems that we've been talking about, why and how have you navigated all this? See, first of all, we should congratulate Honorable Prime Minister and Prime Minister's team. We NRIs, about 25 million NRIs, they are staying outside India. Before, we had a lot of restrictions to invest in our own country, in our motherland. First of all, we should congratulate the NRI investment to be treated as domestic investment. That is a big achievement and as a big change that the new government made. So it became easy for us to invest in India and arise. Not only me, but from different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. They are very easy to uh, invest in our country. Number two, an investor, what an investor need is infrastructure, human resources, strong economy, and is the laws, the regulations, rightly our Honorable Secretary told. So now things are moving, at least changing. First of all, NRIs are happy that they can bring their money and invest in all sectors because it's treated as domestic investment. Mm -hmm. That's a great achievement. And because we, 40, since 45 years, a lot of restrictions for NRIs to invest in India agriculture sector, retail sector, or uh, shopping mall sector, or real estate sector, a lot of uh, restrictions were there. So when this new regulation, new rule they implemented, that an RI investment should be treated as domestic investment, we can do the business like an, uh, an Indian company is doing, number one. We constructed one of India's biggest shopping mall in Cochin. And we also, we are hypermarket people mainly. We started our first hypermarket in Kerala. Kerala, people were talking that Kerala is not investor friendly. But I showed to the world and the people and the NRIs that Kerala, the state of Kerala is investor friendly. I constructed and I started my hyper, first hypermarket in Cochin, Kerala, since two years. Mm -hmm. Now I am constructing another shopping mall and hypermarket in Trivandrum. And one more in Lucknow, Uttar Pradesh. So these new regulations plus our strong economy. India is a developing country, that means a developed country. What is the definition of developing country? Means developed country, mm. we can say. Not 100% uh, not developed, but it is developing. So in, this de in the development, we should also part of that development. Then we can also develop. I strongly believe that. Yeah. So, I, yes, please. I, I find it... Uh, uh, <laughs> Maybe ironic, maybe amusing too. And Sri, help me out here. If I'm not mistaken, is, is the state government in Kerala still still communist? Yes. yes. <laughs> it is. Yes. I find it uh, hugely ironic and amusing that you that you set up hypermarts in, no, in Kerala. No, when the new regulation and the new uh, ease of doing business, rightly secretary yeah. told. Now the states are competing themselves. They are looking what the other states are doing what the new laws the other states are implementing. And they are also strong thinking that why the other states are getting more investment and not to us. So even the Carolan government is open for business? Kerala is open for investment. Oh, not okay. the pre not only the that, previous uh, government, there is a communist government. Okay. But they are liberalized policies, they are following liberalized policies, and they are passing the GST and supported government for the GST. Mm. And the government, see, the mainly, the, now, 
our human resource is very strong. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, if you go to any other countries, there we have to bring the human resource from outside, suppose. In India, we have got educated boys, intellectual uh, boys and girls who is ready to work. Mm -hmm. That's a big achievement for our country. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of chief ministers are traveling all over the world to bring investment to their own state. Because otherwise, they will be in problem because their unemployment will increase. So even the Kerala government, I can tell, now we are constructing uh, India's biggest, uh, I told, explained, largest uh, convention center mm. with, with a child. So this, this is a part of tourism, part of, uh, uh, you know, we can invite so many people and conferences. This and the Kerala is a beautiful country, God's own country. So it's a, liba, liba, they have to go through the central government's new rules and regulations, otherwise there will be a problem for them to give employment to their new generation. So, so Ali, uh, let me ask you, with, this, yes. with the Modi government's focus on, yes. on manufacturing, this whole Make in India uh, yes, yes. policy, uh, your group has obviously the means, and you personally obviously have the means yes. as well, if you wanted to diversify into manufacturing in India. Yes, yes, yes. Is that part of your plan? See, now all states are inviting the investors to come to their own state and their single window policies. Now a single window policy started in so many governments, so many states. Mm. Any, any problem for the investors or the business people should go through single window. Within 45 days they should give, within 30, uh, 60 days they should give uh, permission for all. <coughs> and single window, that means the same office will coordinate with the main problem, but right, rightly that Mr. Rajan mentioned, is a lack of coordination. Mm -hmm. Because we cannot go to 10 departments to get this environment, we have to protect our environment, mm -hmm. we have to protect our, our nature, this is all, all the So, one agency will go and take all the permissions as per the government guidelines. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is a, a very po positive uh, you know, policy of the different states' governments. Okay, but but it could be improved. I think uh, uh, with Sheree's point at this uh, at this more local level. And I want to bring Rachel in on this as well. As Uber, you're in what is 20, 28 cities in mm -hmm. India right now, and yes. with plans to expand more. As you push forward to expand mm -hmm. more into more cities in uh, uh, in India, your, your distribution, this this complex web, this sort of the sclerotic nature of, of local regulations, is that, is that a problem for you? Is that a problem for Uber? Our, our perspective on this is uh, somewhat different. We have observed in countries where you have um, more devolved power at city and state level, often you can get the kind of innovation that we're bringing in more quickly. Oh. Um, and we see that um, in places like India, we see it in places like America, we see it in places like Brazil and in Australia. The thing about, um, there's a sort of tendency, I think, to think that, you know, if central government would just pass the perfect regulation, then everything would be perfect. Mm. Um, and sometimes it doesn't turn out like that. Um, and in places like Germany and other places, we've seen that the exact opposite happens. And so, um, you know, I think uh, in the way that the government talks about having some good competitive tension between the states and the cities is actually a really valuable thing for businesses. And certainly for businesses that are trying to do new things, um, that has been really important to us and really important to our success. Now, of course, there are things that you can do at a central government level to simplify and make simple. Um, but I think as a company, we are very much in favor of cities and individual states um, trying different approaches because otherwise you're just simply not going to get the innovation. So if you look in some parts of the world, some cities are very open to doing public transit partnerships with us. So we can effectively extend the metro or the bus network using Uber Pool and our services, push a button, get a ride, take you to the metro stop, take you to the bus stop. And some cities are not interested in doing that. And so we are always a bit anxious around homogeneity. Uh, we think as a, as a hyper-local company that the differences in government can be incredibly powerful for innovation and entrepreneurship. And you want to be very careful about throwing those out. Mm. Okay, fair enough. I, I need to ask you though, uh, your, your closest competitor, of course, uh, Ola, uh, in terms of uh, cities they're in and operating in and distribution, I think outnumbers you five to one. I mean, that, that, that's a fact right now, right? How important is it for a company like Uber to gain more distribution, to get into more cities, or is it more where your business model operates 
better, which tends to be urban centers, doesn't it? I think that the most important thing for us is to have the best customer experience, whether you're on the driver's side or whether you're on the rider's side. What matters to riders is reliability. They want waiting times, what we call ETAs, estimated time of arrival, under 10 minutes, preferably under five minutes. That is super important. They want to know that you have safety protections built in using the technology. They want to know that it's convenient. And so that actually really, really matters. And on the driver's side, they want rewarding earning opportunities. And so you have to, there's a lot of technology that goes into making the car and the rider get to the same point at the same time. And so for us, a lot of where we see the competitive advantage is in having better technology, better product, better customer experience. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're focused on. And we only want to go into cities when we know that we can do a really, really great job there and that we can continually improve the service. So yes, of course, over a period of time, you'd like to be in more cities, but what actually matters is, are you doing a really great job, as far as we're concerned, from our customer's perspective, in the cities that we're in, okay. before going to more? Yes. And they're just different strategies that you pursue, but that's how we approach it. Okay, I'm just curious, show of hands, how many people in the audience use Uber? Wow, nice. And regularly? I think that says a, a fair bit. Okay, that, that's good to know. Note that down. Uh, Shri, we talked about this uh, earlier on. What Uber is doing, the disruption uh, in transportation. Where else do you see this ripe? What other uh, sectors or industries are ripe for this kind of disruption in India? We, we talked a little bit about uh, financial services, and I apologize to bankers in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> So financial services is the next obvious one. And I think, uh, you know, the, the climate or the environment is right for that. We have 900 million people plus who are connected to the network, to the telecom network. We have 200 million plus smartphone users. We also have a problem of financial inclusion, which means that we don't have enough people who are part of the banking network mm -hmm. and who are dependent on uh, you know, let's say local money lenders or dependent on other means to actually get access, whether it's to credit or other types of uh, banking mechanisms. And I think over the course of the last few years, we've seen the RBI in particular do many things, for example, come up with the payment banks, the small banks, you know, banking licenses on tap and so on. Uh, and also allowing telecom operators to also be a part of the banking system, whether it's in terms of payments or anything else. There's a lot to be done. And I feel that, uh, and this is something that's not specific to India, but with the advent of, fin of fintech, essentially, and the, the potential of what it can do to the financial services place, marketplace, I think is enormous. Mm. But even more so in a place like India where we have so many people who just don't have access to the financial services marketplace. And it's not just banking, it's even insurance. Mm. And the government is, has done a lot in my mind to, to provide cheap, uh, for example, cheap insurance, uh, health insurance and even life insurance. But there's a lot more that needs to be done to make sure that they become a part of the banking system as well. So I would say that's the, that's the place where I think we will have the biggest impact over the course of the next at least five years, but maybe even 10 years. Okay, your industrial policy, so this is, a, this is not quite your space, but uh, generally I'm interested in finding out the financial system in India, not that there aren't private banks, there are, HDFC, ICICI, et cetera, but predominantly it is the big state uh, banks. And a lot of people think, look, for uh, this stage of development in India, maybe that needs to change. What happens when disruption uh, in fintech really starts taking hold. As a government official, I mean, you've got the bulk of the banking system, state banks. Chances are they're not going to be ready for it. What do you do? See, till two years back, it was an uphill task opening a bank account in India. Mm. Even for people like us, we had to approach the bank branch three times to open a branch, open an account. Now 250 million accounts have been opened in the banks in last two years. This, uh, the combination of uh, this digital unique identity, Aadhaar, mobile phones, and these bank accounts is completely transformational for our society as well as for the economy. The kind of transformation that is bringing out in the whole country is enormous. 
through direct benefit transfer. People, money is going to the directly into the accounts of the people. It is also stopping the you know, uh, misuse of subsidy money. It is actually a lot of um, abuse of the system is also you know, being removed because of use of the, these tools now, mm. financial technology. Mm. So I think uh, this is simply not a question of just improving the financial system, which is very critical. And the government is all for it. See, the, gov the government today in India wants to use all the possible technologies to improve governance. And use of financial technology is only one part of it. So it is being used to improve governance, to stop all this misuse of subsidy money. You look at the LPG subsidy. Huge amount of money has been saved mm. because of you know, uh, targeted uh, uh, DBT. Mm. So I think this is extremely important for our economy, society, and those funds which are saved uh, is uh, being used for infrastructure development, for which we definitely need more funds. What happens to the big state-owned banks uh, that are not ready for it, which could potentially, they could potentially get literally rolled over by the fintechs because thousands of jobs are at stake when, and I've talked to several people about this, I think one of the biggest issues for India as it continues trying to, to ramp uh, developmentally is where are the jobs? Which sector is going to create jobs? What happens? See, this, all, all the disruptive technologies like fintech or uh, aggregation like Uber, all the, there is a big challenge for the existing large players. They have to adapt to it, whether it's the public sector banks or private sector banks or any other business. And as a matter of fact, our uh, government wants to promote innovation in the country. We have a big program, Startup India, for prom to promote startups in the country, which is already the third largest ecosystem in the world. But now we are providing the enabling conditions for startups to flourish. So that is our stress on improving innovation, improving the disruptive technology, and trying to help change the regulations and the laws, which are actually stopping the further growth of the startups and innovations. Mm -hmm. So we are absolutely all for it. Mm -hmm. And if uh, banks, public sector, private sector, or any large company, they don't adapt to these kind of disruptive technologies, they will suffer. They will suffer. Yeah, and but no is one is going to shed it. They will suffer, that. but is the government yeah. willing to let some, maybe many of these banks fail? Or are they too big to fail? See, I mean, the bank, uh, government is doing uh, everything possible to recapitalize the banks. Mm -hmm. You know, there are uh, stressed assets. We all know that. There is a legacy to it. But everything is being done as required under the Basel norms. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there is any uh, challenge as of now. But it is being addressed by the government and the regulator. Okay, Shri, let me come to you because I know we talked about this earlier on, and this is not uh, really actually along this continuum uh, uh, with the three points, entry, uh, doing business, and also exit, but I think it's still important to talk about. And that is uh, uh, related to what uh, Ramesh was talking about. Injuries, India is mired in this situation, has been for some years now, where the credit cycle is not working. The CapEx cycle, it's not working because we had this binge of lending to infrastructure. Many of those projects did not quite pan out the way that a lot of people, let's say, had hoped. Now banks are choked up with NPAs. And look, this is the situation we're in, and we're looking at the government for, for fiscal help. How do we get out of this situation? I think it's a, it's a very good question, Martin, because it's very clear that the private investment cycle has not started. And what the government is attempting to do is to prime the pump by putting in public investment into the economy. The issue in my mind is the following, which is that we are see, we've seen an uptick in terms of automotive. For example, over the course of the last six months, two-wheeler sales have gone up, passenger vehicle sales have gone up. There's been some, I think, pretty good improvement in terms of consumer durables. But we haven't seen actually an uplift in terms of volume, in terms of consumer products. You know, uh, the consumer non-durables. And that, in my mind, is a reflection of the sentiment of the consumer. Typically, you know, when, when people buy consumer durables, it's because of a one-off payment. So let's say the seventh pay commissions put money into people's pockets. They get a chunk of money. They say, okay, let me do something that's one time, which might be to improve the, the home or buy a two-wheeler or a car or whatever it is. Because India is a consumption-driven economy, we have to see the consumption go up for us to go to the 10%, the double digit growth rates that Mr. Abhishek was talking about. My personal sense is that the priming of the pump may work. We'll see, mm. I think it's early days yet. So the money that's gone into the infrastructure projects, the expectation is that ultimately that will lead to putting more money into the consumer's pockets. As capacity utilization goes up in the private sector, which is hovering somewhere in the range of 70% today, when it gets to 85%, 90%, that people in the private sector will feel more confident 
about putting money into the ground, meaning they will start putting money, investment money in terms of whether it's greenfield, uh, brownfield projects, whatever that might be. So I think we are a little ways away. What is not helping is the state of the global economy. And our expos exports performance has actually been pretty poor mm -hmm. over the course of the last, uh, you know, say more than a year or so. And so given that context and given the fact that we still haven't seen the private CapEx cycle pick up, we're probably still some ways away before we will start seeing consumers come back in full force mm -hmm. into the economy. Once that happens, I think it will be a sustained period. The, the concern in my mind a little bit is that uh, we want to make sure that inflation doesn't come back up. Mm. Uh, I think we've, got a, we've had a lot of recent good news. The monsoons have been good. The RBI move in terms of 25 basis points uh, reduction. The defense pensions, the seventh pay commission. There's lots of reasons as to why we ought to be optimistic. Shouldn't that be a good bump up for yes. consumption now? Yes, and I think there's a, there's a, there are a lot of good reasons as to why we ought to be optimistic. But I think it's too early to make the call yet. Mm. That's my take on it. Mm. Okay, fair enough. On this whole issue of uh, what's gone wrong with infrastructure, uh, right? Uh, I want to get the government perspective on this because we've talked to uh, a, a number of people. And it's basically at heart, and maybe it's easier for me to say this because I'm an outsider, right? Uh, I'm not going to get pelted or I whatever when I step on the oh, Please, Regarding sir, the banking. Yes, yes. We were discussing about banks, innovation, new technologies. See, since eight, nine years, a lot of banks liquidated or bankrupt outside India. You can see. But a single bank either liquidated or bankrupt. These banks I'm talking. So our banking management system is very good. That we have to complement that. <laughs> uh, Thanks. You, uh, you should accept that compliment graciously. I think. <laughs> He's speaking the truth, sir. Uh, okay. I don't um. want to mention the countries, <laughs> but I can give the name. I mean, uh, uh, how many how many uh, banks in different countries you can go through? How de de liquidated or bankrupt? But find out one Indian bank either liquidated or bankrupt. No. Okay, fair enough. I, 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 I take your point there. Um, Ramesh, back to this whole issue of, uh, of infrastructure and the problems associated with it. Uh, again, probably easier for me to say because I'm an outsider and if I step out of this room afterwards, I'm probably not going to get pelted. But uh, a lot of people think it boils down to sort of a, a philosophical issue with the government. That with these PPP partnerships, what's really missing is that last P the partnership with the private sector in the sense that private entities feel like the government is going, okay, look, so we've got this infrastructure deficit. We need to build roads, hydros, whatever, right? Come on in, okay? We want your money, but we can't actually guarantee they're going to make a decent return. In many cases, uh, maybe some of these returns were, were capped or in, in, with the case of a lot of these NPAs, they're not even there uh, anymore. This obviously needs to change, doesn't it? Since the PPP uh, concept is uh, quite a misunderstood concept actually and it's a problem around the world. Uh, people don't realize that there's no specific model of PPP anywhere. You can have a very large number of permutations and combinations of public-private partnership because ultimately it is about how the risk is being shared by various by the government and the private sector in what proportion, in what manner. So there are issues everywhere on this. Uh, we had a lot of PPP projects in highways. Many of them worked well in the past, but many of them didn't work very well because the growth projections were not there and maybe the bidding was very aggressive. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, government has tried in the last two years to fix a lot of those issues. Mm -hmm. Those projects could, which could not take off for any reason, those have been you know, closed mm -hmm. and large number of them have been re are being revived now. Mm -hmm. But I think the important thing is that uh, we have to work if the go more government funding is required, definitely government is now putting in more funds and the private sector is now taking less risk. But you see the government has recently taken a decision that any, any construction project... But does less risk for the private sector mean commensurately less return? No, or? Perfect, you know, see, every model is different that the private sector has to work out if sir, it works sir, for them. I want to add one. Please, sir. Yeah. Yes. 16 years before, the first PPP project, private-public partnership project, yes. we implemented in state of Kerala, Cochin International Airport. Okay. 
in the history of infrastructure project after 4 years we started giving dividend. Anybody can go and see Cochin International Airport. Mm. This is the model because PPP is future now and every all countries including developing or developed countries they are talking about PPP project. So, this is a role model Cochin International Airport. Mm. I want to mention I am honored that I am, I am a board member there, a promoter director there. Okay. Actually, well, large number of li yes. many litigations were there uh, between the developers and the government agencies. Yeah. And recently, government decided that whenever there is an arbitration award in favor of the developer, 75 percent of the money would be given to the developer upfront, mm. be, even if you go in appeal, and that money goes to the lender, the bank. So it helps uh, bring more liquidity to the system. So this meeting was taken, and the views were taken because this is a listening government, and the cabinet took this decision. This itself is going to inject at least 20, 30,000 crore rupees just like that into the system. Mm -hmm. So whenever the problems are there, the government is trying to identify those problems and the solutions. Mm -hmm. And this has been implemented. This is a very good example. This has been done in the last one month. Real quickly before you uh, throw it out to the audience here, I mean, one of the problems obviously is uh, the legacy of this whole infrastructure uh, binge and uh, I guess uh, boom and bust uh, are the NPAs, right? At issue now is what do you do about these assets? The whole bad bank idea, okay, Raghav Rajawino wasn't a big fan of it. Now, Urja Patel, MPC, it's back on the table. How does the government feel about this? See, the, the government has made its views very clear. See, the NPA is a legacy, and you have to look at how to resolve whatever you can. Mm -hmm. There are willful defaulters, but not everyone is a willful defaulter. So you have to try and see that whether the project can be revived. So I think that is the intention of the government, mm -hmm. to reduce the NPAs, try to revive projects, help the promoters wherever possible, and of course deal differently with the willful defaulters. So I think that is what uh, government and both RBI are working on. So you're saying the, uh, the bad bank idea is not back on the table? Uh, I'm sorry? The bad bank idea is no. not back no, on the uh, table? Let's see what is the view of the regulator on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. It's probably time. I'm sure you're chomping at the bits. Uh, I'd like to get whoever would like to uh, to interact uh, with our panelists here. Questions, comments, please just raise your hands, uh, tell us who you are, where you're from, who you represent, and who your question or comment is directed to. Thank you. Okay, I'm Mitesh Shah from uh, Louis Dreyfus. Uh, we are um, uh, a big merchandiser of uh, commodities uh, globally, um, and we trade a lot of uh, commodities in India as well. Uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Abhishek. Um, and, uh, it has to do with the ease of doing business. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll touch upon, there are many pain points, but I'll touch upon just one. Um, and that, that has to do with contract enforcement in India. I mean, we have uh, so many um, legal issues uh, with regards to contract performance um, on, uh, on commodities that we sell to or buy from within India. And it takes ages to get a, it's a civil lawsuit in the end, and it takes ages to get uh, you know, anything substantial worked out in the judiciary um, in India. So what is it that, and I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, we are probably uh, ranked uh, the lowest um, on, on that in the World Bank uh, Index. Uh, probably 186 if I'm not mistaken, out of 189 countries. So uh, what is it that the government is doing on, uh, on the ease of doing business with regards to contract uh, enforcement? Thank you. Thank you. Contract enforcement, of course, is a very big issue for any business. And uh, recognizing that in last two years, the parliament has enacted a law on setting up commercial courts because we know that there is a huge uh, backlog of cases in judiciary and it takes a uh, pretty long time. For commercial cases now, commercial benches have, are being set up. Many have been set up in many high courts, specific dedicated commercial benches only for commercial cases. And at the district level also, commercial courts have been set up in many states and they are being set up in other states. As a matter of fact, we have kept it as one of the indicators on ease of doing business index of the states, whether they have set up these commercial courts. So this is something that is happening now, but this needs to be fast tracked because you don't, we don't have enough case courts right now, dedicated courts, which will address all these contract enforcement issues. But this is something that's very much on the radar. We are working with the states and the states are working with the high courts to provide the necessary infrastructure. We have such courts in Mumbai, Delhi, some state like Chhattisgarh, they have been very proactive. But then we are going to work with the states this coming year and because this work was started last year so that we have more of these courts and uh, they'll be fast track all these contract enforcement disputes. It sounds like a judicial capacity uh, issue. Anybody else? Next. Sir, please. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. 
Ladies first, please. <laughs> My question is, um, I'm actually, I'm Kenny Kadawana. I'm involved in, um, we designed to build of airports, Delhi International Airport, Mumbai Airport. So it's very relevant to the PPP ah. structure. So I wanted to give my input and actually... Are, are you with GMR? No, no, we're a private entity, do the finishes, develop, ah, design. Okay. So yeah. we worked with GMR and worked with GBK. Okay. So it's very interesting, the contrast. And just um, from the government point of view, when we're talking about PPPs and sort of the decline fall of PPPs, um, we don't, we actually specialize and we'll make sure that we don't participate in a government-run airport. We've declined a lot of government-run airports. For, and, and the reason is because, and we all know this, is the bottom, I think the crux of it is obviously corruption, which the Modi government talks a lot about. Mm. And I think the liquidity crunch that we're talking about has a lot to do with corruption. My question is that what we find is you have the developer who has a liquidity crunch because of cost overruns, which is always down the line due to corruption through the various elements. Mm. They claim the liquidity crunch due to corruption on the government level and therefore not being paid for their cost overruns. Mm. And that's causing a vicious cycle of what I call a vicious cycle of corruption and a decline in infrastructure investment and the airport areas are going down and now government is promoting roadworks and reducing their investment in airports, yeah, right. Yeah. And so is there an entity or has the government thought of an entity a solution that I could come up with from the private sector is some sort of auditing where a go the government angle on the PPP is to come in to the private sector and audit the level of corruptions and cost overruns that they're facing because we all know what's happening to GMR, we all know what's happening to GBK. And the GMR experience went really good because, you know, GM Rao is very, you know, hands on ethical. We, we work together very closely and, and he tries to avoid that. However, they're very open about the fact that there is this level of corruption with the government. GVK, on the other hand, delegates, I won't say anything more, but the point is that, the point is that you've got private entities who are not being paid up to 20%, you know, from our partners, you know, vendor partners such as IBM, ABB, ourselves, we're from Bramco. We, you're not being paid for, let's say, 20% of your project value, which you can imagine an infrastructure project is, is much lower than your margin. So you're causing a liquidity crunch and you're stifling the private sector completely, which is going to lead to this vicious cycle of decline. So how can you get involved in avoiding this, mm. apart from policy making? <laughs> Wrong issue, you're, you're on your own here. Yes. <laughs> uh, see, while not uh, commenting on specific projects and uh, specific companies, I may just uh, like to state that uh, uh, it may be an oversimplification to say that uh, all the liquidity crunch issues in a project are because of corruption. Mm. Uh, this has to be looked into. Uh, so I will not, not commenting on a specific project, but then there could be a lot of problems like design issues, so the, the way this whole thing, uh, project was designed, whether uh, the developer has de uh, delivered on the promises paid, et cetera, et cetera. There could be so many issues. Okay. Uh, maybe they have been very aggressive in what they were projecting as the revenues. Mm. So uh, one has to look at it on a case-to-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. So far as uh, transparency and corruption are concerned, uh, this is a very, very strong uh, determination of the central government today mm -hmm. to have complete transparency in the way business is done in the government. But your question is more on, uh, on an audit system, correct? Yeah. No, but you know, talking about corruption, I think. No. So uh, there's tremendous stress on doing things in a transparent manner. Mm -hmm. There is no crony capitalism. No one is going to get an extra favor. No one is getting extra favor because someone is close to somebody. The rules are same. It is a system-driven uh, policies. So that is the same level playing field for everyone. Mm -hmm. There could be specific issues one can look into. But then I think uh, from a developer's point of view, uh, one has to go see whether uh, where the fault lies. All right. We've got time for probably, uh, let's see Behind here. You, Have we, oh, I'm sorry, sir, we missed you, yes. My name is uh, Thomas Kurvela from Arthur D. Little. I will just make a statement because I see somebody from Uber and a very passionate Malayali here. I am from Kerala. You cannot take an Uber taxi from Trivandrum Airport because the Trivandrum Airport drivers will harm the Uber driver or the car. It's a fact. And I have to pay 650 rupees from the airport to my home and Uber costs only 175 rupees, less than one third. This is a fact. 
and uh, comment and your is there, is there, okay that's that's a pretty that's a pretty rough situation for consumers if you're flying into that airport yes. but yeah. is there is there a question in there for for Rachel is here. how are you what are you going to do for ah. it? I am not getting any benefit ah, okay. I'm still paying three times yeah, I can. Yes, and we have the life, government here we have a very passionate Malayali here we <laughs> talk great things about Kerala I'm very happy about that and we have Uber here see I oh, came to know okay, about I can I answer I, I, this? I, I, can I answer? Please, sir. Yes. I came to know this thing just now. Right. But in, I can assure you in Cochin airports, not like that. <laughs> 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 but, but even though you are a Malayali, okay, you are complained, I will uh, discuss with the authorities there what I can do and I will suggest to the government. I am also Vice Chairman of NORCA, Non-Resident Kerala It Affairs. So I will discuss with our Honorable Chief Minister regarding this. And as early as possible, uh, I will get some, I, some result. I can respond. <laughs> please. As a matter of fact, uh, these are the kind of issues that this Committee on E-Commerce is looking at. And there are a whole lot of other issues also relating to this sector. There are many restrictive policies in many states that have been brought to our attention. Uh, when the committee finalizes its recommendations, we'll definitely keep in mind that uh, we have practices which are transparent, which are pro-competition. So I think we'll uh, definitely keep all these issues in mind. Okay, more importantly though, on the ground, I mean, look, let's so see, I, I want to go to this airport. I haven't been to Trivandrum Airport for okay. 20 years, but um, it is not the only airport in the world where these issues happen. Uh, the reality is that when you're coming in as a new entrant and you're doing something that is very different, and where you have is established companies that have been doing what they've been doing for a long time. The incumbents, the incumbents are not going to be happy. Unsurprisingly, um, it affects people and they do behave in certain ways that are not particularly pro-competition. And so it's incumbent on us to keep going, to keep pushing, to work hard, to demonstrate that we can add value in that city. And over time, we find that these sorts of problems tend to go away. And I think there are ways in which government can help us. Um, but, you know, it's not, I think, necessarily entirely surprising that when you're doing something that's very, very different, which is what Uber is doing, and you have to accept that when you're the person coming in and doing something very different, that sometimes it takes time. And there are certain places where it takes a bit longer. And as our CEO Travis would say, in some parts of Europe, I've learned that I just have to be very, very patient. Oh, okay. Patience obviously is yes. a virtue, but let's say I'm a consumer. I suspect he wasn't at the front of the queue when it was being handed out. Of but anyway, he's learning it. Okay, very quickly. Let's say I'm a consumer, and uh, I'm very familiar with the Uber experience, mm -hmm. and I land at this airport, mm -hmm. and I want the same sort of experience, okay. right? Yeah. What do I do if I know that, oh my God, I go and try and uh, get into an Uber cab, this guy's going to get the living crap beat out of him mm -hmm. by this, this existing union yeah. uh, guy? Even though, hey, better experience, I pay, what, a sixth the price? One third. A third the price. But I can't. So the wonderful thing that we found is all around the world, um, our customers, whether they're on the rider side or the driver's side, are very good at telling government when things are broken, and they're very active about it. Um, in London, we had a, a strange situation where the government wanted to introduce minimum five-minute wait times, and it could, couldn't have cars in the app. And I think within 24 hours, 150,000 people had signed a petition saying it didn't seem the most sensible way to regulate smartphones. Um, and unsurprisingly, the proposal went somewhere else and didn't arrive. So I think that our, the, the wonderful thing about um, having something that people really care about, whether it's on the driver's side or the rider's side, is they are very proactive in telling government about how they feel about things. And I'm sure in Trivandrum, uh, the, we are having an active and um, excitable uh, dialogue with the government. Dialogue is what we always describe it, but probably a little bit different. But I, you know, over time it will change and we'll get there. And there are many ways in which other parts of government can be helpful to us in helping to simplify things. As far as you know, are, are Uber users organizing there? <laughs> no? You don't know how powerful the union is in Kerala, my friend. Ah. <laughs> okay, all right. We've got time for, I think, uh... ah, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Ma'am, please, please. So Sri, thanks for pointing out to me. I'm Neelam, I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And my question is carrying forward from that lady there and her feedback. You know, while the con comments went, Mr. Abhishek, uh, on uh, corruption, that's not the only issue. The key issue also is in large projects, the government officials don't want to sign off completion and the last payments don't come. And the, the fear 
the fear that I've accepted the completion of a large project is so huge that people just don't do it. And I know she mentioned it, the different factors, but this is really pulling us back from bidding. And when the project is big, when it's multi-million dollars project, and you know the bottom 25%, when the project is getting completed, has to be signed off, we feel somewhere, contract or no contract, which somebody pointed out, or process or no process, that gets stuck. Mm. And it's the fear of accepting the closure of completion. Mm. Okay. And is there and that that is making very difficult for us to do business, especially on large projects, bringing innovative solutions, bringing the technology which matters for today and tomorrow mm. into the country. Ramesh, would you like to yeah. respond? Actually, one of the things we do uh, very proactively is to uh, get suggestions from stakeholders about what are the challenges, what are the problems. We talk to investing companies, existing investors, and we try to address and solve those problems working with the states and other central government departments. So I request uh, her and others to share with us these kind of issues and problems they are facing, in uh, wherever they are facing. And I can assure that we will be taking up with the concerned stakeholders, departments, and states in a very proactive manner. Sharing with the government, though, ma'am, is not going to solve this issue of fear of signing off on a contract, though, correct? Uh, we'll address that also, not what, what, Okay, what more would you like to see from the government? Sorry? What more would you like to see from the government? I, I think if the sign-offs happen, completion happens, the, the final payments get moved, that's, that's the most important thing. And, you know, it, it is extremely difficult to do the business until this gets settled. Because as she li rightly pointed out, the last 20% is perhaps more than the profitability of that project. And the delays in it is causing us grief. I, I, I just expect from the government that when we sign an agreement with them on a project, let's follow the agreement. Mm. Why, why is it that, you know, we need an audit? Say it in the agreement. We need the audit before we pay you your final money. Say it in the agreement that we want you to go get the third party to certify your completion before we pay you. Mm. And we are happy because we are walking in with knowing what we need to do to get the closure. Is this a contract law issue then? Uh, so this is, this is the kind of feedback that helped the government make that recent decision mm -hmm. to give to 75% of the money of the arbitration amount, you know, mm -hmm. arbitration reward amount. So these feedbacks are very important for us. Please share with us all this information and I can assure that we will take it up with the concerned ministries and departments. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I can't say that she's wrong. I mean, obviously it doesn't make sense what she's saying. Yeah. Okay. And final question, sir. So all through this session, people have been putting questions which are to their personal companies, and that's disappointing because there's nobody's talking about the business in India. I'm a farmer representing farmer interests, and when you're looking at business, my question is very simple. Do you build one metro station, in, one metro in Pune, which costs 15,000 crore, 12,000 crore rupees, or do you make, with that same investment, 30,000 custom hiring centers that you have one, one custom hiring center in every 20 villages? Is the business investment of the government bringing in social equity inclusive growth? Mm -hmm. And that's what the government must be answering. Okay, Ramesh, I'm sorry, it's you again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, see, uh, various investments are made for various objectives. One can always argue that this could have been spent elsewhere in a better manner. Mm. I mean, but then ultimately, you know, it is the governments that take a decision about allocation of these public funds. So far, the private, uh, of course, funds are concerned. It's the market that decides the allocation, uh, most efficient use of capital. But where the government is concerned, they have to respond to the various issues. Agriculture is critical. Infrastructure is important. Urbanization is very important in our country. You know, we have 31% of the population urbanized, and 600 million people are going to live in the, uh, urban areas in India by 2030. So we have to provide them with you know efficient transport and you know energy etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's like one can always argue on that. I mean, not everyone will agree, of course. Okay. All right. Uh, sadly, unfortunately, we have to. We're just out of time. We could go on for hours, but thank you so much all for uh, joining us this afternoon and a big round of applause, a big hand for our panel, and Sri, Rachel, Ramesh, and Yusuf, and thank you for joining us.